the scripture reading this morning will be from Mark chapter 12. Mark chapter 12, verses 28 to 30. I'll be reading out of the ESV. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Uh, this morning, it is my privilege to introduce our senior sermon speaker, Timothy Kennard. Uh, Timothy, is there anyone you want to introduce before I continue on? Well, welcome. We're glad you're all here this morning. Before sunset, Timothy came from the long, long, faraway place of Seagraves, Texas. It's a long and arduous journey to get to Lubbock, I'm sure. One that you've never made before, so it's just it's a long ways to go. Uh, before starting in the School of Biblical Studies, Timothy was an AIMS student, and that's where I first got to, to really get to know him. And I think one of my earliest concrete memories of him uh, was during a, a 5K. And we're we're doing this 5K, and I look up and I see two guys walking around with a gallon of water and a bag of donuts. And that was Timothy. And, and in that moment, I thought to myself, I don't know what to make of this guy. Um, it, w- it was pretty hilarious. But I've gotten to know him a whole lot better since, and I'm all the better for it. And a number of AIM students have been blessed, and I've been blessed, and I know everyone on AIM staff has been blessed by his presence and his desire to serve the Lord, and I'm super thankful for, for you. Um, before, when coming to Sunset, um, he came to, to grow towards a continued life of ministry, uh, particularly with a focus on, on missions. Uh, some of the joys that he's had while here have been uh, his instructors and in classes, definitely his classmates working with AIM, and just a, a place where he can make connections with people here, but also with people outside of these walls. And God has, has blessed him through all those relationships and connections. Um, in particular, marriage has been a, a very great source of joy for him so far. Some of the trials he's he's dealt with, though, have been uh, just a new marriage, just as well, and, and all the learning that's involved in that process, um, along with juggling some outside jobs and responsibilities, and and often just wondering if if He's done things the best way that he could and really wanting to, to strive to be more like Christ. And in terms of, of godly qualities, uh, compassion, wisdom, uh, boldness, and I'd say gentleness are, are qualities that, that really have come to define Timothy to me. Someone who, who cares deeply and you know he cares about you. He makes it evident through his words and actions. After sunset, he plans to work with the Children's Home of Lubbock as well as continuing his work with AIM. Um, while preparing to to go on mission with a team to New Zealand. I'm excited about that. I'm excited for where you've come from and who you are and what God has been doing to you. Brother, come preach the word. This is surreal. I do want to jump right into uh, Mark chapter 12, and I don't mean to rush. There's just a lot that I want to cover this morning. Um, To give you maybe a 30,000 foot view, um, this morning the plan is to look at the greatest commandment, to look at the Shema, to see that there might be a block for us to address that block and to see what happens when we are able to embrace the things that block us from loving God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and with all of our strength. So as Robbie read a minute ago in John, or sorry, Mark chapter 12, uh, verse 28 and following, Jesus is approached with the question, what is the most important commandment? And this is a pretty common question that was asked of Jewish rabbis at the time. What's the most important. And there was debates all over the place. So it's a pretty common question. And Jesus's answer is the Shema. Now I won't go too deep into the Shema. It's been uh, covered really, 
really well. But I really want to focus in on that command to love. To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Now, we have to remember that even though this is a Greek word and a Greek text, this is a Jewish audience and a Jewish rabbi. So we have to think, how does the Hebrew thinker think about the word love? Um, one, one language and a Jewish expert would uh, call the Hebrew words overstuffed suitcases of meaning. Um, to put that in perspective, uh, the English language has over 400,000 words. Hebrew has about 8,000. These words are stuffed with meaning. And so when we hear love, it's not infatuation or, or good feelings towards God. It's an active engagement. And when we appreciate that, the greatest command to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength is not just a message to love God with everything we have. That's a good message, and it's a right message. But even more so, it gives us a framework for how to engage actively with that love. Your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. Your heart can be seen uh, by definition the fountain and seat of the thoughts, passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, and endeavors. It's your vision caster. It's your looking towards something, a problem. It's, it's marching forth as a king in his kingdom. The soul can be thought of as by definition, the seat of the feelings, desires, affections, and aversions. It's tender, maybe sad. It's, it's compassionate. It's empathetic. And we love God with our tenderness, with our soul. We also have the mind. It's, it's the idea of uh, understanding of the scholar. It's a lot of what we do here of diving deep into the scripture to see the beauty of God's word, to see the beauty of wisdom that he shares and to uh, love God with all of our mind. And finally, our strength, our ability, our force, and our might. Um, picture a, a warrior. Picture someone going into battle in boldness to preach the word, to service. It's a way we interact with our physical world and the people that we interact with. It's pretty easy, right? Your whole heart, your whole soul, all of your mind, and all of your strength. It's, it's simple. I'm done. Yay, no amens. Cool. Um, <clears throat> but the fact is, it's not easy. Now, all of us, we, all of us have one or two that we might come, that might come really naturally. You might be really naturally strong and powerful and bold. You might be really naturally tender. You might be really naturally, you might be a really natural scholar. Uh, you might be um, just that vision setting man or woman, but if we only love God with one dimension of our being, then we only have a one-dimensional love. And that's not satisfactory. So what stops us from loving God with everything? What stops us from giving God the deepest parts of ourselves? In October, about a quarter mile southwest of the middle of nowhere in Kansas, I met a boy. This boy was joyful. He was happy. He loved people, and he was energetic and funny and great. He loved dinosaurs. He was like the kid from, uh, from Jurassic Park. Remember the kid that could spout out all the facts, and he's read all the books, and see all the pictures, and it wasn't just like the T-Rex and the Triceratops. Like, he knew the dinosaurs and no one else knew. But he also had messages. He had messages that were explicit and implicit that he was not seen. That he was the problem. That he was the issue. That, the, that he was disposable at a core level. A couple of you guys know where I'm going with this. The boy was me. The boy is me. And it's scary as all get out to throw that out. And don't worry, it's just getting started. Um, our inner child is the personification of our deepest longings and desires. And because we live in a post-Genesis 3 world, those 
children, those inner child, the inner children often have deep wounds directly tied to those longings and desires. Think for a second about your own. Think for a second about what are the, and and not just like the surface level, the deep longings of your heart. Maybe you, in a sense, had one or both parents physically or emotionally absent, and you just want to be seen. Maybe your child feels like they are the problem, that no matter what they'll do, they'll mess it up. They just want to know that they're good. They may never have been good enough for a a dad, a coach, a romantic interest. And they just want to know that they can be loved without conditions. Maybe hitting a little closer to home, the person who should have loved them hurt them the worst, so they wonder if they can ever be safe. And what do we do with these children? What do we do with the inner child that is screaming for validation, that is screaming for belonging, that is screaming to just be loved? I propose that we do two things that are negative and one that we should do. Um, If you want to start turning to Mark chapter 10, we'll be there in just a second. In the meantime, I want to explore one of the things that we do. Often we take those questions, those longings, to the wrong thing or to the wrong person. Um, how many of you guys are graduating this weekend? Will your question get answered by having a pulpit job? Will your question be answered by where you go, your titles, your advancement? I work for this church, or I'm able to step up into this ministry. See, and, and it's not just ministry. We go to our jobs and our um, opportunities and things like that to answer the question. But let me tell you, and I'm, I want you to hear this, they will always disappoint. The other one, the other area that we, that we go to to answer the questions, we go to our loved ones. And men out there, we're especially bad at this. Do you ever go to your spouse for validation? Do you ever go to your significant other to say, am I worthy? Do you ever find your, yourself placing your ultimate hopes and dreams into your children, into your parents, into your significant relationships? And I wanted to, and this is, I, I don't want to rabbit trail, but I'm really convicted of this, that if you put your ultimate hopes and dreams into someone other than Jesus, you will crush them under the weight of your expectations. You will crush them under the weight of your expectations because they were never meant to answer that question. So if we don't take the question to our jobs, we don't take the question to our family, where do we go? And that's where Mark chapter 10 plays its part. Mark chapter 10, verse 13, And they were bringing children to him, that is Jesus, and that he might touch them, and the disciples rebuked them. I'm afraid this dynamic is something that happens in our own heart. That Mark chapter 10 verse 13 plays itself out over and over and over again in our own heart. And it looks something like this. Our child, our inner child cries, I want to be validated. Get over yourself. I want to be loved. I want to be accepted. You're being selfish. Other people have it worse. I just just want to be helped. I just want to be held. You have to go preach. And we rebuke the child of our heart as it's longing for Jesus to answer the questions that our soul is screaming out. But listen to the rest of the passage, starting in verse 14. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant at the people blocking the children getting to him. Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them, took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Our faith heritage is really good about appreciating why Jesus says to be like the children. I genuinely believe that. But the mandate to let children come to Jesus must include the child still dwelling in the hearts of men and women. 
the core level questions of belonging, value, worthiness, and relational standing can only be answered by Jesus. Any pursuit of these questions outside of him results in dissatisfaction at its best and complete destruction at its worst. When people meet Jesus, they become whole. And we see this over and over again. A man who is blind is whole in his sight after meeting Jesus. A man who has leprosy and his body is literally falling apart in front of him becomes whole and healed when he comes into contact with Jesus. And, and people who struggle with demons running ragged in their hearts and their minds and their bodies are whole as they're safe in Jesus. And our children are no exception because when the deepest longings of our heart get answered by Christ, we're free to Shema. We're free to love the Lord with all of our heart, with all of our passion, because Jesus counts us worthy to participate in his vision. We're able to love him fully with our soul, with our tenderness, because Jesus is a good and safe lover. We're able to love him with our mind and our pursuit of wisdom because Jesus is wise, and he invites us more and more into his wisdom. And we're able to love him with all of our strength, all of our power, and our boldness because Jesus marches ahead, behind, and within us, and he doesn't mess around. Now, I want to transition a little bit. Because this isn't, this isn't spiritual narcissism. Have you noticed how much of spirituality ends up just building the self up? Because if the end of your uh, spiritual, your um, theological pursuit ends with you or ends with greater morality, then God has become the means, not the end. And we don't want to do that, right? I hope. <laughs> we don't want to do that. So back to Mark chapter 12. Twelve, verse 30, And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second commandment is this, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And these are always tied together. No matter where you read the greatest commandment, no matter which book, they're always inseparable. And there's actually a, a story that I think really puts a picture of it. Um, I promised Amy I wouldn't play this video, so I'm just going to tell the story of this of this music video. Um, it involves a dog, and so it's game over. Um, there's a song called uh, Happier by a producer named Marshmallow. I don't, I'm not making this up. Um, <laughs> the the song it's a it's a beautiful it's a beautiful song, and the the video tells an incredible story that really puts in perspective this idea of Shema, so that we may love our neighbor. The story opens with the little girl. She's at her birthday party. And you know when you're a young child that your parents invite everybody. They invite your classmates and they invite your neighbors. And you haven't really had time to establish those friendships. So it's just kids your age. <laughs> That's your peers. And we find this girl at the party like that. And it's her party and no one sees her. We see her at a table with the cake. And the kids are here and parents are there. And she's crying because... She doesn't belong at her own birthday party. Her father brings in a box. It's her, her first present, and she opens it, and it's a yellow bow about that big with a little circle around it of material, and she's trying to figure out, like, well, what is it? Don't get up. You know, the <laughs> he brings out a golden retriever, a little puppy. The bow was a collar, and she instantly falls in love with this dog. It is a beautiful sight as you watch them grow up together. And she marked her height on the, on the door frames and then we mark the puppy's height and then grow up. And you fast forward years later and she's at school and she loves soccer. And she's one to play for the team. And they pick a girl around her. They pick the next girl and the next girl and the next girl and the next girl. And she's the last one picked. She doesn't belong. But man, when she goes home, She's able to take that same soccer ball to her backyard, and the dog loves her, and they play together, and there's joy and vibrancy and beauty in this relationship. 
a little while later, everybody's getting a little older, and it's picture day, and the girl's at school and in a group picture for that soccer team. And she's trying to just survive being on the edge. She doesn't want to be pulled in because the girls are cruel. The photographer finally convinces her to get in the group and, and smile real big, revealing her braces. And they laugh and they make fun of her to the point where she runs home, eyes full of tears and her mouth being covered by her hand. And she jumps on the couch and just buries and sobs into the cushion. And then there's a paw on her leg. And the dog comforts her and, and kisses her. And um, she was like, okay, let's, let's go play. Um, but the, you see the medicine bottles, the dog's getting older. I shouldn't have looked at you. <laughs> um, the dog's getting older, and uh, one day she walks into the living room, and the dog's not moving. She yells for her dad, and then they scoop up the dog, and they take it to the vet, and you see the girl sitting on the table with the dog's lap in her head as the vet shares that there's really not much to do, that it's time. And she hugs the dog and pets the dog and is sharing this last moment, sobbing, and the dog's petting her back like dogs do. And she looks down the hall into the eyes of her best friend as they go to the back room, and she never sees the dog again. The video fast-forwards about 20 years, and the girl is now a mom. She has the same yellow bow. And she walks into her dad's house again. We see a similar scene that we opened with, except it's her daughter, in the seat. It's her daughter with the friends running around. And her dad brings the box and opens it up, and it's a red bow with some material around. Could it be? He brings out the golden retriever for the daughter, and the mom loses it. But it's a joyful, beautiful moment. Her inner child is able to connect with the inner child of her daughter better than anyone on the planet. We cannot share God beyond our own view of him. And likewise, we can only love people on the level that we are willing to venture ourselves. I'll say that again. We cannot share God beyond our own view of him. And likewise, we can only love people on the level that we are willing to venture to ourselves. Now, this isn't a black and white. You either love here or you don't love. Um, this is more of a, you, you, can, you can love without going there, but why would you want to? Why not go deeper? What would change in our churches if we pursued this question in the arms of Jesus in community? What would happen if you went to a church and when somebody asked you how you're doing, you felt safe to say something besides you're doing really good? What if... I see you was all you had to say because it was the truth. How would it change your church relationships? How would it change your marriage, your relationships? Um, quick story before I wrap up. Um, this actually literally happened last weekend. <laughs> um, I was being a, I was being very cold. I was being very angry. Um, and I have a habit of walling people out. Remember this vulnerability? It's, it's scary. <laughs> About wall people out. And Amy takes the brunt of that sometimes. And for a couple of days, I, I walled her out, and I was, I was cold, and I was angry. Um, I was sad, and it wasn't pointed towards her, but she paid the dividends like is often too true. And I finally remember uh, I sat at my desk, and she had already started to go to bed. and um, We weren't fighting. It was just distance, and I was making it. And um, I sit at my desk, and I look at this kid, a kid who loves dinosaurs, who is joyful, who is needing something. And I was able to let him crawl into the arms of Jesus and just be held. What did that do to my marriage? It, it allows me to go into the room and say, I'm sorry that I'm not angry and I'm sad. I'm really just scared out of my mind. I'm scared I'm going to drop the ball. I'm scared I'm juggling too many plates, and that's coming out as anger. But 
I'm scared. And she says, it's okay. I see you. She I told her, uh, I got to spend some time with this boy. And I, I remember this forever. She said, did you get him straightened out? Yeah. I did. He did. Because he was able to crawl into the lap of Jesus to be, as Mark chapter 10 puts it, touched and blessed by the hand of the Savior. When Jesus is asked, what is the most important commandment? He tells the people to love the Lord their God with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. All of us have a child that needs something, that needs answers to questions that are deeper than oftentimes we have words for. But when we allow our child to step in to the arms of Jesus, to be held, to be affirmed, to be protected, to be safe, we are free to Shema. We are free to love the Lord with everything we have, and we are free to love our neighbor as ourselves.